Hello. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, actually the, the first uh, CPM seminar of uh, this academic year. And uh, it is certainly my great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Hiro Onodaira, um, uh, who is uh, currently a postdoc um, at Cornell University and a research scientist at NTT uh, Research. And uh, so Hiro is also a, a, an incoming uh, assistant professor at uh, University of Toronto. Uh, and uh, he got his uh, PhD at, uh, from uh, Stanford University. And uh, so I, I and did undergrad at, at U of T. So I, I believe that uh, uh, I knew about uh, Hero's works more uh, uh, previously, more on the quantum optics side. But I, I realized in you know, like recent years and his uh, research effort more and more uh, evolved towards uh, uh, information processing, optical computing, uh, photonic. Uh, computing, and uh, I believe this is uh, um, also the topic uh, uh, on today's talk. And yeah, so uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, Kai. Yeah, I knew Kai from when he was at Stanford and Shanghai's group, so it's it's really nice that we're both gonna be uh, in Canada moving forward. Uh, yeah, as uh, as Kai pointed out, today's talk will be uh, on a two dimensionally programmable photonic chip for classical and quantum information processing. Uh, so to give you just a very high level overview. Uh, I am mostly going to talk about work experiments that were in the classical domain, but this 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 kind of platform has implication for quantum photonics moving forward. So you know, obviously, the pitch for my job at U of T is to kind of bond these two these two themes, uh, and and hope to tell you more about this today. Okay, so before I begin my talk, I always like to give like a two slide summary, so something you can take away with. Um, so the the key point here in this work is that we built a photonic chip with a real-time programmable refractive index contrast. So typically when you fabricate a photonic chip, um, you lithographically etch it away and it's fixed. Um, instead, we tried to build a chip where you can change the refractive index contrast in real time. So what we did here is we have a chip where we shine light from the top of, onto the top of the chip. And what you can do is you can actually bend, for example, the light that you shine on the chip, and that correspondingly allows you to bend the waveguide. And this is something you cannot do on a on a lithographically etched chip, because once you etch it away, I mean, it's gone. It's like a statue, right? Uh, so this is the kind of platform that we developed recently uh, in this work, uh, which if you're interested, you're welcome to browse. Uh, and so the first part of the talk, as Kai sort of alluded to, will be focused on machine learning acceleration, uh, you know, optical computing applications of using platforms like this. In the second part of the talk, I'm going to show an extension of this work to allow you to give you a real-time programmable Kai 2 of X or Z. For those of you who know what this is, this is like the nonlinear susceptibility, which allows you to do nonlinear optics, quantum optics. Uh, so in particular, we have some preliminary results showing, again, in the classical domain, second harmonic generation, uh, where you can actually do periodic polling uh, with this uh, Chi 2 and allow you to, for example, get the second harmonic light here. And, and we're actually working towards SPDC in the lab right now at Cornell. All right, so with that, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues uh, before I start. Uh, this work was done predominantly in Peter McMahon's group at Cornell, uh, where I was a postdoc. Uh, Martin Stein was a co-lead on the project, excellent graduate student. He's going to become a postdoc at Yale. Uh, and Viol Tatu is the lead for this nonlinear uh, Chi 2 extension, which some of you in the audience may know for his also, uh, also for his work in quantum optics. All right, so with that, um, I want to give like a very quick pitch for why programmable photonics for information processing. And, and the answer is very simple. You know, Many of you have laptops right now and they can run different programs. When you do information processing, you want it to be able to do a variety of tasks instead of a fixed task. Uh, and that's the same, uh, the same is true for photonic information processing. There are two dominant ones that I'm gonna focus on for this talk and also mostly for my research program moving forward, just photonic quantum computing and machine learning and photonics. So in the case of uh, uh, quantum computing, uh, since we're in Canada, I thought I'm obliged um, sort of spiritually to show something from Xanadu. Uh, we have a Xanadu quantum computer they published in 2021. Uh, where there's really three core parts to it. There's the generation of the quantum light, uh, there's the programmable interaction, and there's the detection. The key here for this talk is to talk about this programmable interaction of light, of quantum light, uh, where, in, for example, in this paper, they showed that by changing the, non the interferometer that you have in the middle, you can solve different computational problems. So right here, they showed that they were able to uh, solve, they were able to solve uh, the vibronic spectra of two different molecules, 
Uh, and this is not possible if you had a fixed network, right? Just like a, if you have a fixed chip that is not tunable in any way, it cannot really do a variety of tasks. This shows you what programmable photonics allows you to do. Uh, the same analogy is true for machine learning of photonics. So just to give a broad overview of how this works, uh, say you wanted to classify whether an image is that of a cat or a dog. This is actually my cat, uh, Kumo. Uh, and so the way you do this is you have an image uh, and you vectorize it, you know, just an RGB set of vectors, and you send that into a, say, a photonic chip. Um, and the input X gets mapped to the output Y through a unitary transformation. And using this output, you can classify which of the, which of the different classes it is. Now, well, one key thing I want uh, folks to know, for the folks who are not so familiar with optical computing, the same reason why quantum computing uh, is touted to work basically transfers over to why it makes sense to do machine learning. The idea here is that once you send in the inputs here, uh, X and, and have detection Y, the actual propagation is completely passive. So you're able to perform computation uh, in a dissipationless way. It's very similar to how if you have uh, folks in the audience uh, with glasses, these are not connected to batteries. They just work passively. And so you're really leveraging this kind of uh, passive propagation of life for computation. All right, now back to the point of programmability, the same idea here for the quantum computer holes, you need to be able to reprogram this chip uh, because you don't always want to just classify cats and dogs. Say uh, you wanted to re uh, repurpose your neural network to classify handwritten digits instead. Uh, what that allow what programmability allows you to do is essentially change the network here on how the inputs are connected to the outputs and you know, as you can see uh, apply to a variety of tasks okay so with that uh, the the core focus of the talk uh, is basically going to be telling you how one can perform large programmable interactions of light and when i started this work uh, in my postdoc uh, the, there were two key platforms uh, that were used for this this broad idea the first is to use free space optics uh, and here we just show an example from quantum computing, but it's also the same in optical computing. You can do it either in free space optics or you can do it in integrated photonics. And there's sort of two distinct platforms actually with many pros and cons uh, respectively. Now, uh, so the first uh, is that in free space optics, you have a huge number of inputs and parameters. I mean, that's basically why a lot of people uh, like, for example, Kai work in metasurfaces, you can encode so much information in this two dimensional plane, right? That's how I see. Uh, and that's really one of the key advantages of free space optics. The second is that it's really great for prototyping. Um, for folks who work in integrated photonics, uh, you you uh, you may not appreciate this, but when you work in the lab and you're able to move a mirror around and just sort of tune it or put a filter in, that's really a, a blessing. You know, like the the fact that you can prototype like you're playing with Lego. Uh, however, there are disadvantages to free space optics. In particular, it's really hard to scale to large phase stable circuits. Uh, this is from uh, an AMO lab. I would say that's the extreme case. You can take this. Or maybe it's a little exaggerated. Uh, but yeah, it is true that when you want to have many, many elements, it, it becomes prohibitively difficult to scale. Uh, finally, and this is quite fundamental as well, is that in free space, there is weak nonlinearity. Non uh, the, the idea here with nonlinearity is that you know when you pass in uh, light through some element, you have an input power and output power. And most of the time, light is linear. Uh, it just happens that photons don't like to interact with each other. Uh, and this is made worse in free space optics because the, 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 the light is, tends to be big, uh, the beams are big, and the interaction lengths are short. Okay, so what about integrated photonics instead? Well, integrated photonics um, basically is almost like an inverse uh, of, of free space optics. It is really easy to realize large phase stable circuits because the entire chip uh, is very small and there's not a lot of uh, there's a there's only common more noise like they, they like to say so you have changes and, and amplitudes and phase shifts but they all apply throughout so it doesn't really affect you uh, you have much stronger nonlinearity so as you can see with this sort of nanophotonic uh, platforms your light is extremely confined in space so your nonlinearity goes up by orders of magnitude uh, but the same inverse is true the size of the computation is small uh, because in free space you have so much uh, place to pack information, you really can't do the same for integrated photonics. Uh, and so if you do like a sort of a, a mapping of all the different uh, dimensionalities, you can get an input output. It tends to be, you know, on the order of tens right now. Uh, and that's a huge issue for the field, right? Finally, uh, there's this idea that you have a long design cycle and fabrication cycle. Uh, so when I was an undergrad at U of T, I worked with Joyce Poon uh, and, I, and I designed a chip. But by the time I graduate, I still haven't gotten the chip back. So in some sense, I haven't learned you know, whether I made many errors uh, when I fabricated that chip. Uh, and so it really tells you, you know, when you have a one year, one year plus, 
sort of uh, loop cycle that, that can really harm sort of the, the learning, the rate at which you can learn new lessons and, and et cetera. And you can contrast that with free space optics where you can make a mistake, maybe 10 mistakes a day. Um, okay, uh, the final thing, which is a little bit subtle, but uh, here that's, you can have programmability uh, with let's say these kinds of Mogzenta interferometers, which I'll describe in more detail, but really the topology is fixed, right? The, you can perform a unitary operation, but no more. Like you can't add a filter in there. Uh, you, can't, you can't send this light back on itself or anything like that once the topology is fixed. Okay, so when I uh, started my postdoc, I started working on this project in programmable photonics. The real high level goal was to start to ask, is there a way in which we can combine uh, the spirit or, or benefits of free space optics and integrated photonics? Uh, and with that, we, we uh, thought a bit, and this is really our solution, is to come up with an integrated photonic chip uh, where the refractive index distribution is real time programmable. And there's actually, a, a, in some sense, a free space component to this, which is that we shine light from the top you know, and use a projector. So it allows you to encode a lot of information, a lot of parameters uh, onto the chip. Uh, one core lesson that I would like to uh, emphasize later on in the talk is that when you have a chip with this many parameters, uh, and we're talking about 10,000 effective parameters, we have a million pixels, but really 10,000 individual things you can tune, as you say, uh, you, you start needing a techniques for machine learning in order to optimize these 10,000 parameters. So this is another work that I'll talk about later on in this talk. Uh, finally, in, in the final part of the talk, I'll show you some preliminary results on this nonlinear extension that I alluded to right at the start. Okay, uh, I'm just tracking my time. Uh, so, so how does this 2D programmable wave guy works? I've, so far, I've just been telling you, okay, this is how this is what it does, but I haven't told you how it works. Uh, one way to uh, give you like a good introduction of this, I thought would be to start from how we fabricated it uh, in, in from a nanofabrication setting. So to begin, we have a silicon substrate here. Uh, silicon substrate essentially uh, was chosen to be conductive because we actually use this as an electrode later on. Uh, and then on top of that, on top of that, uh, we have a lithium nano based slab waveguide. So in a lithium nano based slab waveguide, um, the core, uh, the most important detail is that the light is confined in the gravity dimension. So if you send light in, it can't actually leave uh, in this dimension, but it can freely traverse in the two-dimensional plane. On top of that, on top of that, we then have a photoconductor. Uh, so as you can see here, this thing will be responsible, uh, will be responsive to the light that we shine on top. Uh, and finally, we have a, we cap it off with an electrode, as you can see here. Uh, and with that, we apply actually a, a voltage across it, uh, which we will explain in a bit. So how does this chip work? The, the first thing to do, uh, like a sort of a simple intuitive demo, is to first show what happens when you put in a beam that has a short uh, width in, in space. So as we learn from optics 101 or, or just waves 101, uh, is that the, the wave will diffract because you sent in a very confined one. Uh, then what we what we have here, and this is all experimental data, just to be clear, is that when you shine light uh, off on the shape of a waveguide, that we can see that the light no longer diffracts, and we've essentially contained the diffraction. Uh, we can actually bend it, uh, and this is what happens here. So how does this work? The way to explain this most intuitively is to take two cuts uh, of the chip, right? So in some, so what we're doing here is we're doing an electrical analysis of this cut and an electrical analysis of the other cut, and at the end of the day. This is really just high school uh, electronics, you know, voltage division. Uh, so what you have here is a voltage source, uh, and you have uh, uh, an impedance from the photoconductor and an impedance associated with the waveguide. When you shine light onto the onto the onto the photoconductor, so like this section over here, this becomes a short circuit, right? And with that, you get essentially a more voltage passing through uh, this lithium nano based slab waveguide. A lithium niobate uh, essentially is an electro-optic material, like uh, the Pockles effect, so some of you may have used it in the lab. So all that means is that when you apply a voltage across it, you can induce a, a change in refractive index. Um, now one should note that this change in refractive index, though we can realize it is small, it's about 10 to the minus three. Um, however, that does allow us actually to do a, a surprising amount of information processing, as I'll get into later. Uh, we think that in lithium niobate, this can be increased by around an uh, order of magnitude, 10 to the minus two. We actually have results in the lab already increasing it by a factor of three. Um, and yeah, actually maybe if we change to other materials in the future, we do think we can go even further up, maybe with say liquid crystals or, or BTO. Uh, but yeah, that's a much more hairy problem, changing materials as I've learned in the nanofab world. 
Okay, so uh, the key here that I'm, I'm showing on the right is that whatever pattern that you project, so here is the green light that we project, and this is sort of the, the refractive index modulation that we expect is happening within the chip. Oh, please, go ahead. This is a yeah. question of understanding. Yeah. You shine light continuously yes. in order to make the waveguide appear. Yes. If you turn off projector, then the waveguide disappears. Yes, yeah. And that is a, a both a blessing and a curse, in, that, in the sense that you actually need to expend energy to continuously set that. Um, you know, in some sense, there are competitive platforms or ideas like phase change materials where it's uh, where it's fixed and static. And I think there's also a lot of benefits to those kinds of platforms too. Yeah. How fast is the response of the conductor? Yeah, so the photoconductor itself is extremely fast. I actually, fast enough, I, I have never measured it and I don't know. But because it's just, uh, what you do is we have a silicon-rich silicon nitride here. And it, it's really strange to call this a photoconductor because it's more or less just an insulator, uh, but we shine it um, above the band gap. Uh, and so those kinds of carrier recombination times are, are very fast, you know, uh, picoseconds, yeah, as you point out. However, what's really slow here is not this photoconductor, but it's the RC time constant of this. You have a huge capacitor here, a centimeter square. Uh, and so, so this is going to be slow. Uh, and I will tell you the number, hopefully it doesn't shock you, it's on the order of Hertz. However, one must think that the comparison is, is not with like a phase modulator that works at a gigahertz, but it's really the clean room time, which is, you know, 10 to the minus four Hertz, uh, which I like to joke, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Uh huh. Uh, right. So in this dimension, uh, it is more or less single mode. It, it's actually, for technical reasons, technically multi mode, but the second order mode has a lot of loss. Uh, where it has a lot of substrate loss. But yeah, we just uh, yeah, we designed it sort of haphazardly, but we could edge it down a little bit, and it would become truly single mode. Uh, but yeah, in the other dimension, uh, uh, it would be completely multi mode, right? In the sense that uh, any light can propagate. Yeah. Incidentally, I really welcome questions. So yeah, please, please keep them coming, especially on a slide like this, where you know it's really like a more or less the the core of how this device works. Okay, great. So uh -huh. what fraction of the energy makes it true? Uh, say again. What fraction of the energy makes it true? Like what's the loss of these waves? Ah, right, right, right. Good. So. These waveguides, uh, in principle, can have very low loss because the trick here is that if you make these oxides thick enough, the light will not see the photoconductor, will not see the substrate, and it's basically a slab waveguide, right? So you can think this is going to be at the lowest possible loss uh, because you're not inducing even any scattering losses. Um, so in principle, it could be, say, I don't know, let's say 10 dB per meter because people have shown that in lithium now. In our chip, we haven't been able to measure that because we have no resonators and we don't have enough length. So we have done the cutback method where you take a chip and you cut it one centimeter shorter and we couldn't see any visible degradation and loss. So we think it's roughly on the order of a dB per centimeter or, or less, like it could be lower, but we don't know. Yeah, but the, the fundamentals, right, uh, suggest that it could be quite low as long as you make these oxides thick enough. And what is the uh, intensity requirement for this optical pump? Uh, would be lower, much, much lower to induce the same refraction exchange compared to the curl nonlinearity? Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a very good question. <laughs> Let me. Okay. So I know the part of how much energy it takes, but how you compare with the curve becomes quite subtle. Okay. So, so first things first, the intensity, if I have, yeah, I do have it here, is milliwatts per centimeter square. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so in some sense, if you have a, a centimeter square, we're still talking like 50 milliwatts. Mm -hmm. From an optical computing perspective, it's not a problem mm -hmm. uh, because your GPU, say, works at you know, 500 watts or something. If you spend 50 milliwatts on this, it's, it's not an issue. If it can do, you know, let's just say a hundredth of what a GPU does, it'll be fine. And we have analysis showing that. For quantum computing, you also don't care about 50 milliwatts uh, when you think about fridges and stuff like that. Um, so, so that's that. Now, your interesting question about comparison to Kerr is, is quite subtle. Now, one thing that we all learn as experimentalists is it's much easier to kill yourself with electricity than light, right? <laughs> and what, what that's saying is that you can draw a lot more power from this, 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 uh, these ports over here uh, than with a laser, right? A laser, the, the most high power lasers you get, you know, average power would still be on the order of a watt, but you can easily draw like 200 watts from that. So in that sense, 
it's hard to compare optics and, and electronics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry for the for the dark analogy, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. So with that, uh, with that sort of um with that out of the way, what we did is we showed, okay, now that we have this, yeah, go please go um, ahead. How fuzzy is the region between uh change index and and the origin index? Yes, that, yes. That affects the resolution. Right. This is an excellent question. So you can actually sort of see this, but I actually I should have mentioned this in, in the talk I just forgot, is that uh, you have this green line and you have this 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 refractive index contrast that we predict from the model. And you can see it's slightly fat. Uh, so really it's on the order of say five micron uh, diffusion length. So if you shine a, a delta function, it will smear out by about five micron. Now that sounds you know extremely low resolution compared to nano lithography, which can give you say on the orders of hundreds of nanometers or tens of nanometers. But really one should also think about the physics a little bit, right? If your refractive index contrast is small, uh, it doesn't really help. Like the single mode waveguide width of this is actually on the order of the diffusion length. Uh, so in that sense, they, they kind of balance out uh, and it doesn't actually hurt you that much in terms of computational performance. Um, one other thing to notice that this smearing comes from essentially the circuit model that I pointed out, kind of the electric field smearing across these things. Uh, and so they're actually designs this more on the electronic end where we think we can uh, circumvent this and make this smaller. Yeah, so you can make this thinner or you can have these things called conductive oxides. But yeah, funny tricks we can play where we think we'll be able to get this lower. But yeah, thanks for that. That's a very good question. Okay, so with that, um, that out of the way, let me just try to pace myself. Twenty minutes. Okay, I'll try to get this in ten minutes. Okay, so um, so with that, we demonstrated we could also do other photonic devices. So here we have a splitter uh, where we take one light and split it into two, uh, and really we just you know drew some ten H function and just put it onto the chip. Uh, and the other thing that we played around with was four F imaging. Uh, maybe a little bit of a stretch to call it imaging, but really what we did is we printed two lenses here uh, to sort of image this light on here. So if you have something within these aperture region, you can actually image it. Uh, the key here, you know, even though it images a very small section, is to show that you can actually draw these kinds of graded index uh, um, components. So these things are called uh, green, green lenses, graded <laughs> index lenses, where you have a quadratic phase shift as a function of, uh, of space. Uh, and that's not regularly possible in uh, lithographically defined waveguides because you have you know binary contrast zero or one, uh, whereas here you can have this continuous contrast by shining light of varying intensity. Okay, so with that, um, as Kai pointed out, I used to be a quantum optics theorist. So whenever I do experiments, I need to have a photograph to prove that I actually did an experiment. Uh, <laughs> and so here we have uh, two uh, microscope objectives for the input and output light. Uh, we, everything looks pretty similar. You have a chip here with an electrode. The key difference is that we have light onto the top of the chip. And so there's like a little pattern here. It's actually a pattern that we use for machine learning. Um, something to notice that the patterns are small enough that uh, a camera, you can't actually see the features. Yeah. How did you do scanning? Is that from SLM? Yes, it's from a DMD that we, but you can use an SLM as well. Some of our setup use SLM, some of our setup use DMD. Okay, great. So the first application uh, that that the first thing that we applied these uh, towards is um, photonic matrix vector multiplier. So the predominant approach uh, for doing this is actually to use single mode waveguides and to couple them with discrete programmable. Well. So this is the approach taken by the field. So what do I mean by this? Uh, so as I alluded to earlier, you send in the input data here, and they're all traveling in these single mode waveguides. Then what you have here are these phase shifters. So this what I call discrete programmable elements that you use to encode your parameters. So phase shift from zero to two pi. And this approach uh, is, this philosophy I would say is basically adopted uh, through a variety of different platforms for performing matrix vector multiplication. So here you have a crossbar array, but the same principle, single mode waveguides, you know, attenuators here. Uh, you have also micro ring resonator wave banks. This is done in the frequency domain. I actually, uh, Bob and Shastri at Queens, also in Canada works on uh, platforms like this. Uh, where you have, say, different frequencies of light and your micro ring resonators are filtering them. Uh, but one of the core difficulties of scaling up this approach is that you have sort of large components uh, that have limited computational efficiency. So, for example, here you have micro ring resonators that are large. And in the case of Mark Zenders, 
you have these phase shifters, but you need to keep them far separated apart to avoid crosstalk. Or you need your waveguides to be far enough so that they don't talk to each other, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the core things that we've been thinking about is to you know, think about what has been holding the field back. And we think this abstraction, this idea of having single mode waveguides and um, having discrete programmable component is one thing that has been holding us back. Uh, so one thing that we started to actively think about, or rather read about in the field, uh, is what if we use the interference of waves instead? Uh, so here's a, a nice paper from Dong Fu Yu and also from Shanghui Fans Group uh, at Stanford showing that what if we could just use the multimode propagation of wave, we can much more spatially compactly perform uh, our desired operation. So here they have an input image two, and this goes through some programmable media, and the light comes out at the corresponding spot to give you the classification. And this idea have actually been generalized even to nonlinear processing of like speech data, et cetera. Um, so, uh, and here we have some experimental demonstrations that are, I would say, along these lines. So the first is by a very old paper by Dimitri Saltis. For those of you uh, who are in the field, he basically did everything or thought of everything you know, like 30 years ago, um, or actually 20 years ago. Uh, and, and here is a photorefractive waveguide where basically it's very similar idea to us where we can shine light from the top. Uh, however, the, the change in refractive index is actually quite small, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. Mm -hmm. So that really limited the scale. Uh, here is actually a much more recent paper by Nader and Getter. Uh, and uh, they wear, they use silicon photonic silicon on insulator, but they lithographically etched like a, a meta structure to perform machine learning. So this set of ideas is starting to gain some grounds in the community. Uh, however, the whole, uh, and uh, from our perspective, we still think there's a missing core component, which is the hardware, right? Either you do it lithographically etched or with very minimal programmability. Uh, so the core here of this work is we show, hey, you can use this new platform that we develop and take this paradigm and apply it towards it. So the, the, the high level thing, just to reiterate, is you can input some image, say two, as an input light. You send that into the chip and you detect the output with a camera and that allows you to tell you, you know, what digit was being, uh, what digit was sent in. The channel input. Yeah, so later on, I'll show you uh, up to 49 dimensional inputs. Um, yeah, but that, that's a really good question, yeah. Uh, and uh, the core here, and I just want you to remember maybe this image, is that we're not using single mode waveguides, right? This is really just multi-mode waves, you know, similar to the waves that you find in a bathtub that is allowing you to do the computation. And you can think of you know, like changing the height of your bathtub programmably uh, to perform this computation. Okay, so with that, uh, here's, uh, you know, this is a, uh, kind of an artist demonstration. Here's actual scientific uh, experimental results. Uh, so we performed two tasks, uh, something with 49 dimensional input, which I'll mention later. But the first task that we showed is vowel classification. So vowel classification is this, I would say, you know, pro probably honestly, a little bit of a toy task that people use for these emerging um, neuromorphic computing platforms. How it, how it works is that you have an actual vowel that's spoken, say R or A. And the first step is there's some feature extraction, okay? Because an actual vowel is like, I don't know, 10,000 dimensional vectors or something. So you take the Fourier components and you get 12 dimensional vector, okay? So you can think these are the Fourier components of this speech. So then this turns into a 12 dimensional input, seven dimensional output problem, where you send it uh, through your, your platform and it gives you a seven dimensional vector and the vector element with the largest amplitude tells you what it's predicting, okay? So that, that's how, how it works, hopefully that was clear. So if this has a peak, then it's R. If that had a peak, then you would classify as an A. All right, so, but how do we actually encode this task onto the chip? Well, very simple. The first thing we did was we actually have a amplitude encoding of the light. So if you have amplitude like this, then like that, and X2 is large, then X2 is large. And this is just the electric field. Uh, so that's how we encoded the light. Uh, so at the data into the light, we actually use a beam shaper to, to, to do this. We send that light into the chip and it undergoes this multi mode wave propagation that, that I uh, talked about earlier. On an output, we have this um, uh, uh, intensity that we measure on a camera. Okay, it's a little bit hard to see on this on the projector, but hopefully you see there's a little bit of a gradient in the color. So we have seven bins over here, that's spatial bins, and we just integrate the power up in these bins. So that gives you these, this, this set of histogram over here. So because this peak um, is very large, that tells you that the predicted vowel spoken is large. Okay, hopefully that's clear. If you have any clarifications, uh, please let me know. Yeah, so with that, uh, we've got 
Um, so this is really showing just one example, but you know, in order to do good science, you have to show many examples and create what's called a confusion matrix. Uh, and so here, what we are showing is a confusion matrix for performing this task with 96% accuracy. Uh, we then went on to do a higher dimensional task with 49 dimensional inputs. Uh, so this is going to your, your question. We can say it's roughly 49 modes. Uh, and so we send that into the chip. And the same thing happens where the light then propagates uh, within the chip. Uh, and there's a peak on the final bin here because we sent it to image 9. Can you actually reach the light on the chip? Or? Yes. So that is a very good question. Um, as you can, uh, as we show here, it says simulator intensity and experimental output intensity. So this is uh, showing that you can actually image the inside of the chip. Um, the, the reason being is that, yeah, the, the loss is low enough that there's not much scattering. Um, that people actually have done imaging of light inside chip where they like build scatterers. Uh, Hui Sao's group at Yale is pretty well known for that. And it's something we're also thinking about because imaging the inside of the chip uh, has obvious benefits, yeah. Um, like being able to have better simulation and reality matches, et cetera. Well, the bright light is 500. This is 1550. So you could you could build a filter uh, around that. Yeah. Think about the, the phase of formation of the light as well. Right. Uh, I mean, in principle, right? Like if you could have light scattered, then you could do something called off-axis digital holography yeah. um, and, and measure the phase. Yeah, but I, I think we'll struggle with intensity. So, so maybe phase would be also a bit ambitious. Yeah, um, but yeah. So information with x-rays, people could take the intensity and figure out the phase. It's right. Coherent diffraction imaging. That's a good point, yeah. That, uh, so that, that, that works because of like an inverse radon transform kind of thing, or? It's more subtle, but there's, sort of a promers chronic type relationship. So the, the phase information is actually in the intensity as well. Mm, I see, I see. I see. Yeah. 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 You're right. It's really the relative phase, not the absolute phase. Right, right. Yeah, well, but that's all we need in, in this <laughs> exactly. trade. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so yeah. So but the, this is a very good point. Um that said I will say that the simulation more or less is pretty close to the experiment. And you can kind of tell if you take this final trace, right? You can see there's a peak here that the simulation predicts the experiment is a bit onto the top. So there's a bit of mismatch, but on the whole, it's predicting what's happening inside the chip. And that's actually essential because if you can't predict it, you, you, we couldn't figure out this pattern to shine and which is a component of the talk that I'll get into. Okay, so something really neat that we did was we overlaid uh, the, the, the pattern that we shine onto the simulated pattern. Uh, and it looks, you know, for, first of all, it's very complicated. It's not human design in any way, but there's some intuition you can get. So you can actually see this kind of meta waveguide that's guiding this beam over to the right point. Um, now, I, yeah, anyways, I, this is a little bit like tea leaf reading, so I don't want to get too into it, but it, it's neat to see that, uh, that there's some, there's some reasoning you can do about what it's figured out. Okay. And we got about 96% uh, accuracy uh, in in the experiment. Uh, and if you use a digital neural network, you can only get 90%. So this is actually quite close to optimal, I would say. Um, I also want to emphasize that uh, even though we have a relatively modest change in refractive index 10 to the minus three, using this multi-mode wave propagation paradigm really allowed us to scale up to much larger sizes. So 49 dimensional input is actually the largest uh, dimensional input for on-chip MVM in the spatial domain. I, I should say there are many caches of this, but the high level thing is, it's much, uh, it's, it's has higher dimensional vectors than say anything like an MZI array, right? If you use time encoding, then then things changes. Yeah. So Go ahead. Figure out what three lines shine. Like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, okay. So I think maybe I'll do something that is frowned upon, but I actually need the remaining time to finish. So I'll, I'll keep a cap to the minimum to for the rest of the talk, and then we'll have like a five minutes at the end. Uh, just because I, I think I'm going to struggle to to finish at this rate. Okay, all right. So how do we go from a blank slate to an optimal pattern? Uh, this is a very good question by Nicholas. Um, and there's two key things that I want you to know. The first is that it's actually quite a difficult optimization problem because you have around ten thousand parameters. You, know, you can see from this image, this is really an image. You know, you can really change this in very uh, 
a variety of ways. The other thing that is actually in some sense a blessing is that this is a general problem. You know, I just told you, hey, how do you optimize something with 10,000 parameters? Uh, it's actually a general problem for complex physical systems, not specific to this wave effect. Um, one thing I will notice, we, we think that there are lessons that we can learn from the field of machine learning that tells us the path you should take when you have to optimize a large number of parameters. The first is that we should use a backpropagation algorithm. So what is the backpropagation algorithm? Uh, the first key thing to notice is this is uh, one of the key things that's ubiquitously used uh, in, in deep learning. In some sense, it is the, the reason deep learning works so well. It was invented by Jeffrey Hinton uh, over in Canada as well. Uh, and and the, the high level idea is that it's a gradient based algorithm. So what do I mean by that? You have some parameters, you take the gradient or the derivative of your loss with respect to parameters and you update them. And the gradient based algorithms are actually much better than gradient free algorithms, okay? Uh, in terms of time it takes to converge. So here's an example where you wanna get to this bottom of the hill and the back propagation algorithm goes much more quickly than gradient free algorithms. Uh, finally, one of the key points uh, that I want you to know uh, is that these gradients are computed very efficiently through analytic auto differentiation, which is a thing I'll talk about in the, uh, in the latter slide. Uh, for folks who are more in the photonics field and may have heard of adjoint method or inverse design, uh, it's the exact analogous thing. It's just a different name, uh, but maybe a more general way of looking at uh, 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 optimization. Okay, so what is the backpropagation algorithm? When I heard about this, it really you know, was, was like black like magic to me. And the, here's the reason. Uh, in the back propagation algorithm, you send in, say, your inputs and parameters, and you do a forward task, which is to say, you predict how well this, this system is going to do on the task, right? So what you then get is you get some output here, and you compare it to some target. And so the difference of that gives you what's called an error vector, which is what do you need to change in order to get your targets and outputs to match better? And you can send this error vector through a differentiable digital model, it's through like a Jacobian essentially, and that gets you the gradient in a single pass. Now think about how unintuitive that is, right? As an experimentalist, say you have 10 parameters to optimize, you would think you need to perturb the system 10 times, you know, go one way, up, down, up, down, up, down 10 times in order to get the gradient. But what the backpropagation algorithm does is that if you have a good model, you can essentially use chain rule in a way to get the same 10 dimensional vector in one single pass. Okay, unintuitive, uh, but once you do the math, you actually kind of see it's quite obvious. But you know, it's retrospectively obvious. That's why it's a big and great result, right? Right. So with that, um, one thing you could do is just use this algorithm. You build a model of your physical system and you just train it and you upload your parameters. So what I mean, so what you do is you do, you do a training with some, with some simulation that you have on your computer. You don't touch the experiment, you get, you get the set of parameters, and in simulation, it will tell you, yeah, you're gonna do really well, you know, 90% or, or so or much higher. What you can then do is you can take this parameter and upload it onto your experiment, right? So you're allowed to do that. Uh, what we did and we showed in this work, uh, earlier work in 2022, is that this approach does not work for complex physical systems. Like if you actually uploaded it, it gets you a, a horrible result, you know, essentially random guessing. Uh, and the reason for that uh, is very simple, which is that it's very difficult for experiment and simulation to match perfectly. Uh, this is actual results from experiments showing if you have some complicated input field here and some complicated pattern here that we just generated randomly, this is our experiment and simulation match. When I saw this, I, you know, I was actually kind of confident that things will work just as simulation. But the fact of the matter is these errors add up, you know, and it add, adds up in the training process because you're actually looping through this training loop with something wrong. So it, it accumulates over time. Sorry, there are two arrows on the right? Yes. Yeah. Red and the blue? Yeah. So the, the red is the experiment, the experimental output data that we measure on the camera. The, the blue is the simulation. And, and the big ones are off by 10% or 20%. I can't see the difference. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I would say it's on the order of 5 to 10%. Yeah, yeah. But but the key is it's, it's not good enough. Yeah, and that that's the sort of the message is even with this level uh, of predict uh, of prediction, it's not good enough. Partially because if you think about it, we're just dealing with waves, right? If you have this wave be off by <laughs> a little bit and it goes into the other bin, you're already you're already uh, you're already out of luck there. Yeah. Okay. So with that, um, the here's the sort of main result uh, that we actually had in this 2022 paper that we're porting over for this. Uh, recent work is physics aware training. So it's a novel uh, algorithm that we came up with. It's a physical digital backpropagation algorithm. It's a hybrid algorithm. 
where in the forward pass, you actually use the physical system and only in the backward pass do you use the differentiable digital model. Uh, so what that allows you to do is essentially your training process will always be grounded in reality because you always get the actual output, you know, not your simulator output when you do this training process. Uh, this algorithm is actually quite general. So in this paper, we showed that you, know, you don't just have to use it for photonics. You could actually use it for a mechanical system, optical electronic system. Uh, we built some toy systems. Uh, this was during COVID uh, to demonstrate our point. Uh, so if, if folks are, you know, have some highly programmable system that they would like to program to, to achieve some desired task, yeah, please feel free to get in touch. We'll be happy to collaborate. Um, so I should also add that uh, part of the pitch, and this has not yet been done, is that you could also easily repurpose this algorithm for quantum uh, states as well. Uh, right now, we, we have two systems in the lab that we're trying to apply it to. So just to be clear, these archive links are not with physics aware training, but it's more like these are systems that we are attempting to apply physics aware training to uh, in Peter's group at Cornell. I thought part of the argument that these algorithms work is it's a random gradient, it's not an absolute gradient. Where's the randomness in the model? Ah, uh, wait, hold on. Random gradient. In other words, yeah. the reason it converges <laughs> is something that seems to make sense. Seems to be there's a random element when they calculate forward simulation of the gradient. Oh, right, right. Stochastic gradient this time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right, right, right. Um, <laughs> yes. So, so you still have that in your system. Yes, we, we do have that. That That's a subtle, you know, sort of very, um, that, <laughs> yeah, the reason it's stochastic is actually more of a technical, uh, statistical reason. But uh, what you have is that you have, uh, you have inputs. Okay, let me try to see if you have input X, right? You can wait till after the talk. Yeah, yeah, okay, it's fine. I think I can answer in two seconds. But this input X is sampled from some distribution of, of inputs, uh, like, for example, the set of vowels. And this sampling noise gives you the stochasticity when you do stochastic gradient descent. Okay. All right, so with that, um, I would show you the results with physics aware training. So essentially repurposing this figure and. Uh, and, and what we have here is an x-axis of epoch and a y-axis of test accuracy. So this is what people always show when they do machine learning, uh, showing that as you progress in the training, your accuracy is getting higher. Uh, another thing that we plotted is what is the evolution of this pattern, right? How, how do we end up at our final pattern? And we started from a blank slate, so nothing, uh, or actually uh, not nothing, but actually half, half of the intensity, the average point. And within the first epoch, you know, like literally that, that first point, it's already evolved to something, you know, pretty complicated looking. So it's basically already figured out at a very early phase what the final phase should look like. Another thing that I wanted to notice that at epoch 20 and 300, you know, to the human eye, these things look very similar, right? But in terms of performance, you, you still are improving by quite a bit, you know, from like 70% to 96%. So it's really showing you that these tiny, little variations is actually changing the wave physics quite a lot. And it also tells you this is why you need a programmable photonic platform to do this. Now, if you try to lithographically etch these things, it's not going to come out perfect and it's going to ruin your machine learning performance. Okay, so with that, this is um, more or less the first two thirds of the talk um, where I've demonstrated how you can have a photonic chip uh, with a reprogrammable refractive index contrast. And also this, this idea of how you actually, when you have something this complex, you actually need to have some inspirations or, or take some tools from the field of machine learning to actually do the optimization. And so with that, uh, we, we move on to the second part of our talk on how we built a photonic chip with a real-time programmable chi2 of x of z. So here, um, just as a recap, what we did in our previous work is that we used the light here to create a spatially varying electric field easy inside the core, like a large electric field. And then using the Pockels effect, we translated this electric field onto the refractive index contract. Well, it turns out if you have this large electric field that's programmable, uh, you can also use that to induce a nonlinearity. So why is that? Okay, so this, this work on inducing the chi2 has actually been shown. Uh, and and this, this set of work is called electric field induced second order harmonic generation, EFISH. Uh, the idea here is that when you apply a large electric field to a central symmetric material like chi 3 you break the symmetry, right? By breaking the symmetry, that you're actually polarizing the, 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 the atoms uh, inside your crystal, 
uh, which allows you to get this effect of kaitu. And I first learned about this idea. Uh, I thought, okay, the kaitu must be quite low, right? Because of how you're doing it. Well, but it turns out it can actually be quite high. So in silicon photonics, if you get close to the breakdown field of silicon, people have demonstrated 40 picometers per volt, uh, which is comparable to lithium nanobate, you know, which is one of the best nonlinear materials possible. So, so uh, to reiterate, we're trying to do this uh, in our current work with silicon nitride instead of silicon, and we demonstrate it on the order of, say, what's in principle possible five, but what we think in the lab possible, maybe one to two picometers per volt. Okay, so yeah, and that's what we're showing here. Um, we also decided on silicon nitride uh, because we think it's a much um, better material for nonlinear optics because of its wide transparency window. Uh, I, I say this work was quite heroic in that you know they needed like an OPA and stuff like that uh, to do this this demonstration because they were limited by this transparency. Okay, so once you have um, nonlinear a nonlinear medium that's programmable, it really opens up a lot of possibilities. The easiest way to see this is in a linear media. Uh, you have an LTI system, uh, and your input frequency uh, and your output frequency is fixed. But with a nonlinear medium, you can now do uh, frequency generation. You can do squeeze-like generation and quantum optics. Uh, so it opens up a lot of possibilities. Uh, here's some preliminary results. Uh, so this is actually led by uh, Rio uh, at Cornell uh, and NGT. And what we see here is that the setup is very analogous. Uh, where you have light shining from the top. But the main difference is we're shining in uh, 1550 or 1535, and we're detecting in its second harmonic, right? Which is something we didn't do in the previous experiment. And here are some preliminary experimental data. Uh, so what we have here is we're sweeping the pump wavelength. You know, we have a CW laser that's swept, and we're measuring the total second harmonic generation signal. Um, and what we have here is different polling periods. So Essentially, we're able to change how we space these gratings out, and that's allowing us to change the transfer function or the peaks of, of when you hit resonance is maybe one way you can think about it. Is the periodicity of the gradient similar to the periodicity of the second harmonic? Ah, uh, so the second harmonic. The harmonics you're generating. Right. So the, the period here is actually given by the difference in the phase velocity of the fundamental and second harmonic. So in some sense, the second harmonic is going to vary at, I don't know, I guess 600, 800 nanometers, right? Very fast. But we actually have gradients on the order of 20, oh, wait, 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 okay. My apologies. 20 microns. Yeah, this is, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is preliminary data. So, so we must have screwed up that plot. My sincere apologies. But yeah, 20 microns, but the actual uh, wavelength is on the order of one micron. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, that's that. Okay, so uh, what are some things you can do? Oh, one thing I should know is people probably have seen these kinds of curves before. The usual way you do this is you actually um, change the temperature of the crystal. So if you vary the temperature of the crystal, you can also change the phase matching. And so this is a curve that people have seen. But the key here is that we actually have a fixed temperature and we're actually just changing the gradient here. Uh, what this means is you can actually play around with more possibilities. So let's say you have a broadband pulse coming in you can actually sort of do some kind of pulse shaping. You can carve out what parts of the pulses you want programmably uh, using this platform. And we actually have some preliminary results on that as well. Yeah, so just to give you, you know, even though this, this plot looks like this is the same thing as temperature tuning, it actually opens up more possibilities. Uh, one uh, funny trick that we, we learned uh, while we were playing around with this trick uh, is that we can actually raster scan this nonlinear grading to image the pump beam. So what do I mean? Suppose you have pump light here, what you can do is you can draw a small second harmonic grading and you can raster scan this throughout the chip, okay? What that allows you to do is image the pump beam, this very nice question you asked earlier. And the reason for that is suppose your grading overlaps with your pump, then you get second harmonic. As it overlaps less, you get less second harmonic, right? So using this raster scanning technique, you can actually figure out how your pump looks inside your chip. Uh, something neat that we actually figured out in the lab is that our beam was tilted. It was not aligned well. Uh, so you can see this tilt. Of course, the x and y axis are not square, so it's on the order of less than a degree, but it's still neat that we could see a misalignment. Uh, we, are, we were also able to see the actual sort of collimation or, or defocusing of the light in the chip using this approach. Okay. So with that, I have, I will just summarize in the final five minutes some applications. I think I'll just go a little fast. Uh, because a lot of this is also, you know, a bit more speculative in the future. Uh, but one, one potential application is that we really want to generate large quantum states of lights uh, in ultrasound pulses. 
Uh, and the reason why we think this is promising is that there are multiple ways to generate large multimodal squeeze light. One being the spatial domain, where you have actual beams of squeeze light interfere them, but another in the frequency or wavelength domain. Uh, and we think that using the frequency domain is very promising because in a single beam of, let's say, 100 femtosecond pulses, these pulses uh, will undergo a, dif a diffraction, uh, sorry, dispersion, uh, and also nonlinearity. And so it actually allows you, when you have the combination of the two, to realize squeeze states of light in multiple uh, sh pulse shapes of light. So you can have one beam, but you can imagine basically that these different uh, frequency spectra will be independently squeezed. Uh, and that's very promising because you can have a lot of squeezing in one single mode. Uh, in fact, this work uh, that recently came out of Peter's group led by Federico uh, showed that you can use schemes like this to generate very large entangled states of light with say more than 300 modes, but also a lot of photons, so more than uh, 800 photons in a single beam. Um, and I'll go through this very quickly, but the high level idea here is that you have a degenerate OPA that generates squeeze light in these multiple modes. Then what we did is we have an adiabatic frequency converter to go from the 1550 nanometer squeeze light to mu a much more visible squeeze light on the order of 600 nanometers. Uh, so once you have that, what's really nice about this is that uh, you can just detect this with an EMCCD camera. Uh, what's also neat, since the, the theme of Peter's group is very much along these lines of having programmability, is that we can actually program the quantum correlation within the output light. So here I'm showing you this co photon correlation matrix. So you can think of having a peak here as if you detect a photon with this wavelength, you're much more likely to detect another photon of this wavelength. I think the covariance matrix, uh, for those of you who are familiar, um, uh, in, in continuous variable quantum information. Okay, so what, what they showed is that if you change the, the pump that you send in, uh, to this adiabatic frequency conversion, you can essentially change the correlations that you get in your output field. Uh, this is very neat, and I think a, a very uh, promising line of work. But what we can see here is that the control is limited. You know, you can do, you can definitely make changes to the covariance matrix to this this uh, correlations, but not not quite enough. For example, to do Gaussian boson sampling or or some of the uh, quantum information applications. So the obvious story where this is going is that we think. There's a route where instead of using these crystals with fixed polling, uh, that if you had a reprogrammable waveguide, that will really open up the possibilities for what you can do uh, in these chips. Okay, uh, and finally, and this is much further out, maybe uh, five years of future, we also think that having the ability to control multimode light uh, in the frequency domain will also enable quantum photonics in the single photon regime. Uh, I have to say this set of ideas really deserve like an hour talk on its own. So I'm really just summarizing the core essence. If you're interested, please check out these papers. The high level idea is that right now in photonics, uh, we're using uh, single photon detectors like SNSPDs uh, to do the nonlinearity for us. And it's cryogenic and it's very much limiting the scalability of quantum photonics. Uh, we think that using ultra short pulses in nonlinear nanophotonic platform can allow us to reach this sort of single photon nonlinear regime, where you can imagine doing single photon detection uh, in optics without any cryogenics. Um, but one of the key components of this is that you actually need to use multimodal squeezing to enhance the nonlinearity uh, and also to use ultra short pulses propagating in nonlinear waveguide that's very difficult to control. So, having this kind of programmability of Chi 2 uh, and just having control over dispersion is going to be quite essential in allowing us to reach this regime. But again, it's quite, it's quite longer term because you need much lower losses and much higher nonlinearity. But in theory, we've been looking into this set of ideas. OK, so with that, I want to summarize the talk. Uh, there's uh, three key components, uh, a device. So we constructed a photonic chip uh, whose refractive index distribution can be programmed in real time. Uh, we mentioned how you can use ideas from machine learning uh, to really enhance the information processing capability. Uh, in the future, there's an extension of this with the nonlinear programmable waveguide, which we want to apply towards quantum optics. Uh, with that, uh, more of a more personal note, uh, in the past few years, I've been at Cornell and NTT. Uh, and uh, next year, I'll be moving to U of T, DC. <laughs> I know, very janky uh, videos. Uh, but yeah, if you have prospective PhD and postdocs that are interested uh, in these topics of optical computing and um, quantum optics, yeah, please, please get in touch. Thank you. Yeah.